Hermit crabs or soldier crabs are really charismatic. How many people remember seeing these sold as a kid? And how many of you had one? There we go. And the question is, just where are our pets coming from? So this particular establishment that's in uh, the Jersey Shore says that they pick them up from Haiti. Well, they actually pick them up at the airport, in Newark or other sites. And um, every year, at one point, an earlier article said that they had a million they brought in. Now, a uh, recent, more recent uh, um, piece said that they were having about 200,000 come in. Not only that, they're nice for the classroom. And so there's even a uh, educational conference that uh, the companies that were selling educational products of the biological type for classrooms we're giving away complimentary hermit crabs. Also, um, ch the pet store chains, now with the major um, chains that you see and online sales, you're seeing them. And of course, you have people who want to be wholesalers. So here is a site, you can pretty well gauge where the site's from, that is selling a thousand hermit crabs or soldier crabs whoever wants them, you can find the site yourself. Um, when it comes to regulations, of course, in the Bahamas, it's illegal to touch or take soldier crabs. In the United States, it's more vague. There is, however, when it comes to the non-lab uh, land crabs, you can actually harvest commercially some of the um, marine ones. So we were, we were really surprised. There's really not so many studies of soldier crabs that have been done. We really don't know a lot about their biology on some of the islands here in the Bahamas. And of course, there's that one island that's studied more than the other ones, which is San Salvador Island. And so uh, we started a pilot studies to see what is the impact of populations? What are the things that are influencing the status of soldier crabs? So um, we looked at a number of sites. We looked at the Derping um, Springs site that's actually on the south end of the island that has a good freshwater source. And also we looked at uh, the sites where you have some uh, lesser uh, lenses in the north end of the island. What's great about uh, these guys is they leave traces. And uh, you actually can tell what shell they're using based on their traces. And so here we have some examples. So basically, one of the questions people always ask is, how do you do your sampling? And I'll mention a little bit about that um, later on. Um, in our two surveys, one from Dripping Springs and one um, from one of the sites near Dump Reef, you can see a, a, a trend here. And one is, is areas where you have a lot of the rocky shoreline, like Dump Reef, you can see that they really like getting into those knobby periwinkles. Um, when you go a little further inland to a site where the dripping strings is at, you see more cerion. And the other thing, too, is that they're using different shells and percentages based on the kind of coast. So if it's a rocky coast, you see something different. If you see, for instance, the um, conch is used more where you have a sandy shore lines. So if you have problems with conch, you could potentially have problems with soldier crabs in areas where you have a very, very dominant sandy shoreline. And of course, when most people think of soldier crabs in the Bahamas, they think of them in the big whelks. And so here is the big purple pincher. Purple pincher is the commercial name that these guys are often um, sold for. And these come, go considerably inland. And here's one in a conch shell. So what your question is, how do you estimate populations of invertebrates? There's birds, there's whales, there's fish. How do you kind of estimate the health of a population of something like this? What are the things that you're going to start thinking about before going out and collecting a bunch of data, thinking about making the observations, thinking about the life history, and then deciding how to make careful studies to collect data on these creatures? So, 
the best, one of the best published life cycles are the ones that you can get with your kid's pet crab from the Jersey Shore. And two key points here. The um, mating and spawning are separate, but the eggs are, of course, just like with the case of the land crabs, they have to be deposited in the surf. And so basically, these crabs on San Sal, they're really keyed into the brief cycle, as I call it. They always like to come and drop eggs off during sea camp or with the teacher's workshop. And uh, during these spring tides, you're going to see these large, just the large females that, come, that are in the whelk shells are the ones that are coming down to drop off eggs. Again, large whelk shells. Now, this is Puerto Rico. And so Debbie and I had often talked about, you know, where would you find uh, these big spawning aggregations? You know, when we're at the conference, let's talk to somebody. They've got to be somewhere. And just like any observation, it seems like Pericles has the answer. <laughs> and he says, you know, in South Andros, and when you think about it, it would make sense. One of the major factors to think about population status, just like with the land, other land crabs, is, is your freshwater lens. And so if you have a freshwater lens that goes clear across the island, then maybe you're going to see something like this. So then the question is, what is the situation that we see in a place like San Salvador Island? Now, here's the beauty of this. When that female crab has eggs, she walks differently than the way she walks after she's deposited those eggs. So the blue arrow indicates heading to the surf. So you have this nice big whelk shell that you can just trudge in there, be pretty stable, brush off those eggs, and you come back. And you can see the clear difference in the trails going and coming. And so therefore, if you do your surveys at beaches and look at this pattern, you can get a number of the breeding females that are in your populations, and you can start to think about cohorts and, and that kind of a population life history. Okay. So what do we find? Again, uh, we found one pair. I found one pair in our site in San Sal to the, uh, adjacent to the field station. The 16th one pair. 17th was a new, uh, new moon, so we saw seven pairs. The 18th four pair, and then the 19th that kind of cycled down. Also had a chance to see a few other sites in the uh, island, including one near the Coburn Town Cemetery where you found 11 pairs that were in the whelks, and then we found four that were in the conch. Interesting, it's next to a conch shack. And then East Beach, we uh, found seven pairs. Okay. So data from these trackways are going to allow us to do some census work. And it's going to give us a good indication of the health of some of these populations. So the other thing, again, is all these pairs of tracks represent the breeding populations. Here's the scary part. No big shells means no big breeding females. This is a very key point. And our question is, what's the population structure? That's another question, and we're going to show you how we address that. And again, thinking about a model, a model that we can use to determine, do we have cohorts? What's the population structure? What are the key parts in the life history of this creature that we can use to track and, and its um, status? OK, there has been a previous studies that of the um, land cra of the hermit cra of soldier crabs. And um, this study uses pitfalls. So think of a plastic cup sunk in the ground and catching anything with a bait that falls into it. And so you can see you're not going to get the big whelks. You're not going to get a lot of the, the intermediate sized shells with this. The other part of this um, study that's important is look at the uh, shell use patterns that they found the prickly periwinkles being the smallest, the knobby periwinkles being intermediate, the uh, top shells being very important because look at this size span of shells that can be available for a hermit crab. And again, if you look at those numbers below, you can see that uh, most of the hermit crabs that you pick up crossing the road so that you don't run over it, 
fit in your hand in, in some places. So those individuals are not represented in this study. You know, there's one shell type that's missing here that I found interesting in the study. Here's our big caucus of um, Syrian. No Syrian were detected in Exumas, which I thought was really unusual. I would think that hermit crabs populations there would be utilizing these guys. Okay. Now, tracing that life cycle. Um, you can see in the box there's a Syrian. If you look really, really, really careful, you kind of see a little reddish dot in the center. That's a crab, and that is a crab that's in a prickly periwinkle. Okay. So, one of the questions is that we would think is that the population's cohorts are going to be fitted with the fitting of the shells. And so, as, as some of you know, these soldier crabs have this very sophisticated way of, of um, exchanging shells. And when they do this, they all congregate to a large shell that fits no, uh, no crab. It's empty. And then once somebody big enough go ahead and get into that and joins the Congo line, so to speak, the others shift and, and occupy the, the shell in front of them. Okay. And I've actually observed two groups in size classes in San Sal like this. You have the very, very small ones that are mainly in the uh, prickly and knobby periwinkles, and then you have another one where you're starting to see uh, moon shells, the larger nerites like blue-eating tooth. Okay. So the larvae, they start out in the tide pools. That's where they get their first shell. Then they go into these subpopulations by the tide. Then they get into these nearshore areas where they have uh, freshwater lens. And we went through and um, did a few uh, measurements. We just did shell measurements. You can use either the shells to get a handle on the cohorts, in our case, or you can actually measure the length of the claw. And there's been the studies to show there's the correlation of the size of the claw, I'm uh, sorry, the size of the claw and, and the um, crab. So, this brings up the big question. There's some things that are really, really significant parts of your flora and fauna that somehow go under the radar, and one of these is the West Indian turban shell, or top shell. Okay. Now, if you want to know what happens when you lose them, all you have to do is think about Bermuda. There's been, there was an extinction of these uh, whelks in Bermuda, and in fact, what happened? the crabs started to use fossil top shells. And so Sally Walker at the University of Georgia did this study. And what else she did too was looked at the patterns that you could find old shells and see how the crabs modified those shells, okay? Um, so here you're seeing shells in really, really bad shape. Another indication that the population is not getting adequate shells. And so basically, the, when you harvest these for food, bait, or marine curios, so what? What are some of the downfalls besides the crabs? No shells, no crabs, so what? Well, there's this interrelationship between ants and crabs. Crabs are the big scavengers. They come in, they pull out the big stuff, and then the ants come later. And so you, if you upset this dynamic and lose the scavenger, this could be a potential problem. But then also, you know, what are the ethics of using these things, removing them? So some of you have been to um, resorts, because we all know you have time to go to resorts when you do field work, and they have crab races. And it gets to the point that there's actually enthusiastic people who collect them as pets, and they actually do things like get upset when the airline won't let you carry them on, so you get a hotel room and you stick them all in the bathroom. And so one of the things that we are doing with support from Psychology in conjunction with BRIEF is kind of a two-way approach. One is to uh, educate people with the touch tank what happens when you have these things for pets. For the crabs themselves, unless you have a whole swarm of them, life isn't good. Okay. 
The other thing, too, is that with the development of the very successful teacher training and these touch tanks, they can be ways to establish um, teaching modules, not only for Kermit crabs, but for conservation and other initiatives that, that are um, being done. So we were, this, these are kind of ideal. They may be ideal pets. That also makes them ideal um, tools to educate here in the Bahamas, in particular educate people that this cute thing, this cute creature is not an ideal pet and people should be aware of the impact of where their pets come from and what they do to the environment. And I just want to thank um, support from Seacology, our friends from Brief that have, we've worked with for a long time, the Gerace Research, and of course the Bahamas National Trust. Thank you.